Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everybody in attendance with us here today. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, our portion of the 2021 Imam Al Ali Spirit of Reform Conference. I would like to first start by thanking Sayyid Jawad Kuzwini, the Ummah Organization, and Ahlul Bayt TV for hosting this wonderful event in honor of our beloved Al Amir Al Mu'mineen. And I'm very excited for our distinguished panel uh, and our topic of discussion today. My name is Tariq Turfi and I'm from Dearborn Heights, Michigan. I'm honored to moderate, moderate this paddle, panel today, excuse me. I'm a fourth generation American Muslim and have been involved in politics, the electoral process and government in many different capacities throughout my life. Currently, I am a attorney at Garen Lukal Miller PC in Detroit, Michigan. First, I would like to introduce to you Sister Zainab Swayj. Zainab is a, has been involved in political activity since her high school days in Iraq, where she was involved in the uprising against Saddam Hussein in the early 1990s. Later, she graduated with degrees in chemistry and dentistry, but still found in herself to be committed to the political process. She was a teacher at Yale for seven years and later founded the American Islamic Congress, where she currently serves as the group's executive director. Next, I would like to introduce Brother Jihad Saleh. Jihad contains a graduate degree from the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs and has actively worked in support of many democratic political campaigns since 2007. Since 2007. Jihad helped develop and deliver the first ever Muslim American resume book to the Obama transition team in 2007 and was an advisory group member for both the faith and African American engagement directors for the Biden Harris 2020 presidential campaign. Currently, Jihad is a senior advisor for advocacy and government affairs at Islamic Relief USA based in Washington, DC. And last, definitely not least, I would like to introduce Brother Suhail Hassan. Suhail graduated from George Washington University with a master's in political management in 2011. Suhail worked for the Obama for America campaign in 2008 and remains involved in the Democratic Party. Suhail is a president, is the president, excuse me, of the South Asian Chamber of Commerce and currently owns a real estate development company that specializes in multifamily complexes located in the greater Houston area. Our topic today is Muslim American involvement in elections here in this country. This topic is so relevant to us as American Muslims today, and it really could be expanded over hours and hours of discussion. Um, however, in order to facilitate a nice and, and thoughtful discussion, we're going to be circling around this panel covering some topics that I believe are really pertinent to us uh, as Muslims participating in this country's electoral process. First, I want to begin with Sister Zainab Swage. Sister Zainab, in your introduction, I touched briefly about your involvement in Iraq with the uprising against Saddam Hussein. There are often competing viewpoints on free democratic elections because the unfortunate reality of many Muslim nations is that these voting procedures are not always consistent with the smooth processes that we enjoy here in the United States. Coming from that background, how do you feel we as Muslims perceive a free democratic election? Thank you very much, Brother Tarek. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm glad and honored to be with you to this afternoon uh, to join this very important and timely conference. I would like to thank uh, Sayyid Qazwini, uh, Ahlul Bayt, uh, TV, and Ummah for uh, putting this panel and this conference actually together. Um, the importance of having a free election as well as having uh, a system that uh, believes in uh, democracy, uh, freedom, and um, gives people uh, the uh, space of practicing their democratic rights, it's priceless. I lived in a community, I lived in a country before. These uh, privileges that we are uh, seeing right now uh, uh, was not uh, available. So when I came to the United States and I was able to go and vote freely for the first time, I felt this is such an important matter. My vote and my voice really matters and make a change. And this is something that I was always uh, felt compelled to share with many people around uh, around the world during my speeches or my talks that I give while I, while I am traveling and uh, giving uh, or doing uh, many lectures around, uh, around the world. Democracy is a process. Definitely our voice is, matters and can make a change. There are many people that I see 
um, they say, well, we, we don't have to go uh, to vote. Our vote uh, does not count. And many excuses like that. In fact, this is, this is something wrong. If we, are, we have to take the lead to make that change. We have to make our candidates a person responsible when we give him or her our vote. These kind of, uh, uh, the practice uh, of election itself can make a huge difference because we as American uh, Muslims or any citizen living in any part of the world, they, we enjoy the freedom of, uh, of uh, giving our vote to the candidates we wish. Mm -hmm. uh, what we see of a benefit to us uh, on a personal level, to our community, and to our uh, uh, country in, in general. So this kind of uh, uh, hesitation that I see sometimes from many people that they don't want to participate, it's really a lost voice. And you don't want your voice to be lost when uh, you are in a, in a country that your vote can count and can make a difference and can also uh, develop your community, your society, and yourself into it. And, and that's some very great insight, uh, Sister Zainab. Now I wanna to turn to Brother Jihad and Sister Zainab touched upon the fact that there's a process, the fact that there is a political process in America that's been tried and true for many hundreds of years. Brother Jihad, you have a background in working in Washington DC and on Capitol Hill for many years and working for many administrations and campaigns. From that perspective, how do you feel Muslim Americans can participate in this process and speak on the grassroots perspective as well? Well, first of all, salam alaikum to everyone. Just make sure everyone can hear me clearly. Perfect. Right. Loud and clear. Brother Curry, thank you so much for having me on this uh, meeting. Uh, and I'll thank you for Brother Sajid uh, Jawad uh, Kazvini for inviting me. And it's, it's a privilege to be on my two esteemed panelists. I do want to say just briefly, uh, as a as up to Zainab's wonderful response, we also must always recognize that elections in the United States are participation or the ability to participate and to vote is not always free and democratic. Uh, we have to recognize that still quite often, particularly in la large parts of the Muslim American community, particularly African American and black and brown and working class communities still consistently have to go above and beyond, have to travel farther, wait longer, have less access to voting stations, or have greater scrutiny or ability to register at times, and then the impact of uh, gerrymandering. And as in we see now still consistently political parties that are, again, even just after this recent election, are submitting, again, ways to make it much more difficult for Americans to vote. A society supposedly built upon the, the most safe, one of the most sacred acts is the ability to vote, and we're consistently making it harder for people to do that. So I just want to recognize that as the Muslim American community, and particularly sections of the no. Muslim American have been essential to expanding and protecting the vote. It is part of our sacred duty to continue to follow through in that struggle. And so that leads to actually to my second part, this ability to be advocates, struggling strivers, for expanding and strengthening America's democracy. And I think that one way that I think Muslim Americans, when I, I look at the work of Muslim Americans across the country, as my work as a humanitarian advocate. It was mentioned I work for Islamic Relief, the nation's largest Muslim humanitarian anti-poverty organization. And I have the privilege to be able to work with Muslim American organizations and others, Christian, Jews, and secular organizations, but increasingly over 200 Muslim organizations nationwide that are food pantry, health clinics, uh, homeless, you know, shelter, domestic violence organizations. Muslim Americans are responding, one, with their donations, their volunteer time, or their own professional capacity in these types of spaces to help Americans in need. But quite often what I'm seeing is even organizations, whether in Houston or Los Angeles or Detroit that are involved and support these type of programs responding to the needs in America. And these are issues that we want our government, we assume our government are also responding to with programs, funding and so forth. We find out that very few seldom do Muslim Americans actually advocate, reach out to their public officials engage federal departments, state departments on an advocacy level. So we're doing the work on the community level, but we have to recognize also we have a vital role to also to raise awareness of how federal government, local governments, 
our elected officials to do better. Remember, these institutions were created if we believe that saying, if you know, the famous saying by uh, Abraham Lincoln that a government by the people, for the people, of the people, for the people. Well, it takes that civic engagement. If you want to take it down to the most basic element, just think about it. Most of us here, I think, or attending or listening are adults. We all pay taxes. That's one thing they say, you, two things you guarantee, you die and pay taxes in America, right? Those are two things. But if you're, well, how often have we had Muslim Americans, as Shi'i Muslims, and Muslims in general, paying our zakat and paying our qums, right? We make that <coughs> a lot. And even we give that money to communities or organizations that implement it for us, we hold them accountable because they're executing, they're, they're, they're taking our money and using it for a cause of a law as part of our religious obligation. All of us are paying taxes. But how often have we ever called our member of Congress and said, I would like to know, I want to know that my tax dollars are going to fund this program to help the homeless or help to reduce higher education fees and so forth. So this kind of secular zakat that we all have to pay, and many of us pay more in our taxes to the federal government than we do in our probably our religious tiffs. How do we go about holding them accountable? So if we have that frame of mind, Muslim Americans are doing important work that's vital to the the, the rights, the opportunities for all Americans. But how do we also say that we can't do it by ourselves in our own institutions, but we got to hold accountable government to also put stronger programs and, and so forth to respond to hunger and homelessness in that own particular framework, right? So I just think that's an example of a way that we should think about how we're engaging more so with our elected officials. And particularly, I would say, in this Biden administration that has put such a, right now during the time of COVID, racial right. injustice, economic insecurity and so forth. These are critical issues we should have a say in also. Right, uh, Brother Jihad. And, and you know, that's that's a very critical point, advocacy and engaging our political leaders uh, at the local, state and federal level. And now I want to turn to Brother Suhail, because on that point, I want to transition to the question of mobilization. You know, how do we mobilize as a voting bloc, as a ummah, as a Muslim community at the local, state, and federal level to really push that advocacy? How do we accomplish that? I mean, we look at the state of Michigan and we saw a razor thin margin in 2016 of just 11,000 votes between former President Trump and Hillary Clinton. In Michigan, there are 270,000 Muslim Americans. You know, this is, is something that when you look at the numbers, we can truly make a difference. How do we mobilize in that form? Absolutely. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this discussion on uh, Muslim involvement in the American elections uh, at the Imam Ali conference, uh, so of course, celebrating the spirit of reform. A uh, special thank you to Mawlana Syed Jawad Khazini for the invitation and for all that he's doing on behalf of social, political, religious, and humanitarian issues all over the world. And of course, thank you, Brother Tariq, for leading this discussion. I'm honored to speak alongside our distinguished panel uh, Sister Zanab, who I had the honor of meeting and spending time with during the inauguration of the governor of Virginia, Mr. Uh, Terry McAuliffe. And, um, you know, she just has such an impressive resume. Uh, I was joking earlier that uh, in high school, I was having trouble passing algebra. And of course, here she was uh, organizing and planning towards uh, overthrowing uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, and of course, Brother Jihad, who's uh, you know, a senior advisor, and he's just been working almost his entire career on behalf of issues that are to uh, the Muslim community. Um, so thank you. And to answer, I think it's first important to note uh, the spirit for this conference, uh, for which we're using this as a tool to spread knowledge all throughout the world. And that is, of course, in the honor and values of the teaching of Imam Ali bin Abi, Abi Talib. Uh, of course, the son-in-law and uh, the cousin of, to Prophet Muhammad. And it's important to note that all of all the countless contributions that Islam has given to the world, one of the most important amongst these, and really defined by Imam Ali for the first time in history, was the fundamental principles of our democracy and our government, and a government that's based on justice, equity, and prosperity for all. So I think it's important that we frame the conversation from the lens of the teachings of Imam Ali, which really provides us as citizens of this great country uh, an obligation to do our civic duty, not only as Americans, but of course as Muslims, because neglecting this duty you know, renders us complicit in the election of those leaders who of course do not represent the interest of our community and Islam in general. 
So when you ask the question about how do we mobilize, it's really making it, the answer is, is really indoctrinating it into our religious beliefs and understanding that it is our religious obligation uh, to do so. And, you know, when you look at the Muslim vote, as you had alluded to in Michigan, I mean, let's look at our community uh, in general and our ability to be sig a significant factor in deciding these elections. So there are an estimated 3.45 million Muslims uh, that live in the U.S. and only that it makes up about 1% of the total population. But our concentrations are in key swing battleground states such as Michigan, Florida, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, right? And this is where we can especially make our vote impactful. And obviously everyone here knows the stakes are particularly high in, in states like Michigan, which Tharuk just talked about, which of course we all know very well. This state has you know, registered around 270,000 registered Muslim voters. And this is where a state where you know, Hillary Clinton lost to Trump in 2016 by less than one percentage point, a little over 10,000 votes, as you mentioned. And now, of course, in this past election, uh, Biden defeated former President Trump by just a mere 150,000 votes. So think about the role that we as Muslims can play in these battleground states, the traditional ones that we know of, like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Florida, and Wisconsin, but now even in states like Georgia and, of course, my home state of Texas. So when it comes down to it, you know, we very much have the ability to swing the election. And now the Muslim vote is necessary as a part of any campaign strategy to win, just like we helped Biden win in this last election. So already we see a huge jump in the 2020 elections in terms of, you know, the involvement of our community in the political process. We just now need to continue these efforts in the future. Brother Jihad, I want to touch on a uh, question that Brother Sohail brought up. We as Muslims, we face a perplexing reality with our on the issues stances when choosing somebody to vote for. Uh, can you speak of uh, how the 2020 election kind of equalized those positions and, and how Muslims grapple with the on the issues of what's important to us, whether it's foreign policy or domestic policy? No, that's an excellent question. And then let's, we also have to recognize and respect that the Muslim American community, like any other community or communities, is not monolithic. It has these very different components to it, um, whether it be by race, whether it be by regional, gender, age, and so forth. And particularly also one thing that we as Americans, not just Muslims, don't talk about, but social economic status and how that also has an impact on your concerns and how you might primarily vote. But in that, you know, one thing that what was unique across the board, I felt. And it op opened up new opportunities for the Muslim American community of how it understood itself and how it was engaged was that, as we know, unfortunately, in 2020, uh, we had the COVID pandemic, which in that many ways was a great equalizer. In that sense, that is very hard to make an argument that there was any other issue, regardless of what community or identity that you're from, is that that was not your number one primary issue. It was an existential threat to so many lives. So many people lost their lives. People know who had family members who were sick and lost their lives in the United States. And this is the same for the Muslim American community across our differences in racial and gender differences. But we also recognize that certain components or certain parts of the Muslim American community were particularly susceptible. Many Muslim communities that live in urban cores or poor um, uh, suburban areas that are health deserts, food security deserts and so forth, the places that we often saw most impacted by COVID in places like in New York and so forth, these are areas where Muslim Americans are, live, have large populations. So we can't assume that no one can make the argument that, well, COVID was not the Muslim American primary issue. And I only say that because again, in past elections, I think it's, uh, and, and I'm gonna say this, I, I support the Hillary Clinton campaign, but I was quite, disappointed when she had the one single time she had the opportunity to speak about Muslim Americans in one of her televised, televised campaign was someone asked about the Muslim American community and her only reference was to say was, oh, the Muslim American community is great. They've been helping us work on national security issues, counterterrorism issues. Is that the only way she understands the Muslim American community? Is that, the, is that what Muslim Americans are most concerned about? Are Muslim Americans in our diversity no different than most other Americans in the sense that we want safe communities, good schools, health care, jobs that pay us something that we can retire to? 
So in this sense, I thought that 2020 campaign election created opportunity where that all Americans by most campaigns were engaged on some of these most singular issues, the COVID pandemic, the economic security, and also these existential threats like climate change and the importance of racial injustice and the reckoning that, and particularly as the Muslim American community being a minority majority community, also all these four areas fall in confines of things that we face on the daily across the board. So in that way, it created opportunity. And I felt that Muslim American organizers, community organizations were very respect, receptive to these and we could do much better, but in context, prior elections were much more ready to strike, to take advantage of these forms of open invitation to speak on these issues and contribute to them through policy dialogues, advisory groups, and so forth. Sister Zainab, you I have- would like, I would like to add one thing to what uh, uh, Brother uh, Jihad have just mentioned about the, uh, the issues of, of uh, American Muslims uh, during the election and how important it is to focus on our domestic issues. Our international international issues, we come from very different backgrounds, many different countries, but people tend to have that tendency to uh, think of an international uh, diplomacy or foreign policy and about uh, many different countries, whether they come from or they care about. And this is not bad to care about, but the most important thing is our immediate issues that we are facing on a daily basis inside our country, inside America. What is our families are facing? What is it, um, uh, different people from, uh, from different backgrounds, whether it's a healthcare, whether it's unemployment or the pandemic issues and many, many other uh, uh, subjects that it's been on the, uh, on the surface. So I think we have to be united. We have to have a mindset of focusing on our internal issue and how to become a strong voice against uh, what is really against our uh, benefit inside inside the country as a citizen. So well, what sister Zainab, I mean, I, I want to speak to that just briefly. I think one of the me one of the causes for that was in the campaign, um, and, and I will say because I was part of the process in the sense that um, for various reasons, historically, the Muslim community in campaigns and elections is largely spoken all, almost synonymy, synonymously for at least past 20 years as also the Arab and South Asian communities. And there's nothing wrong. These are central key components. And there's also the Persian and Turkish and so forth. But these are dominant huge groups. But as we all know, it's actually only two of the three major groups. The third other major group in the Muslim American community is the African American Black experience. And part of the campaign, I saw the first time where even Obama and Hillary did never really touched upon this was also creating space where that also the African American Muslim community was equally engaged as a Muslim identity. And that helped create a balance that where sometimes, again, it's perception. I don't even believe that Arab American, South Asian American, so forth, only are concerned about international affairs. But having that anchor, also having African American Muslims in part of the dialogue and be engaged was able to pull back and say, there's key issues that are domestic. And then two, if you see a lot of the engagement or those Muslim Americans who were formerly part of the campaign who were advisors, they're also very much of a newer, younger generation, most of them younger than me. I'm, you can see the gray in my beard. I'm not young anymore. And I think there is also a she change going on now, a whole new generation of Muslim American youth who have been born, raised, and know nothing else but the United States compared to parents who are building that path for the past 30 or 40 years, but still maybe has some, a greater attachment to what was going internationally. Muslim youth who are much more involved now are attuned to what's happening themselves as clearly as American citizens, who have are able to make that balance of concerns domestically and also still those international policies right. too. And Jihad, that's a, a perfect issue and, and a perfect real transition to, to Brother uh, Suhail. You know, I, I want to discuss our participation as Muslims in elections, not because we're Muslim, but because we're American. You know, I, like I said in my introduction, I'm a fourth generation American citizen. I only know the American process. And I feel like as we are in a transitory period between uh, individuals that emigrated from overseas to individuals that are born and raised as only American citizens, how does that take into effect where we go as a, as a faith, as an ummah, as Muslims in, in America? No, you're absolutely correct. And, uh, you know, this is a good opportunity to look at our friends in the Jewish community. 
who have really over the last, you know, four or five decades been able to embed themselves into the political process. And as you know, you all correctly stated, you know, many of our parents, of course, were immigrants to this country, and we therefore are first generation Americans, but it's therefore our duty to try and do better by our children so that they can in turn try and do better for their, ch their children. Now, we've already started to shatter this glass ceiling of sorts with the elections of several Muslims uh, in local and national positions. Um, of course, you know, we have Keith Ellison and Andre Carson, uh, both congressmen who are kind of the, the trailblazers for this. And now they've been joined uh, by, of course, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib and Omar Ilan. So, it is important for us to continue to engage in these elections on a local level. And, you know, there are several Muslim organizations uh, that are like Engage, for example, that are dedicated to helping our community engage in this political process. So I would encourage you to get involved and, you know, for our viewers to do their part because, you know, time will only tell uh, what this new generation of American Muslims will achieve for Muslims in America and indeed for all Americans. And uh, I see we have about uh, four or five minutes left. So uh, my final question to you all as panelists, we could begin with Sister Zainab uh, and then uh, move to Brother Jihad and then conclude with Brother Suhail, is I want you to give a, a one minute spirited elevator pitch for the importance of participation in the American electoral system. I want you to really dig deep and, and touch base with our panelists and inspire them to get out into the voting booth uh, in the next election and every uh, election thereafter. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think it is important to follow uh, uh, the uh, the path in a, in a uh, as we said, in, in a deeply spiritual way. Our religion and our beliefs and our, uh, 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 what, what, we have, what we have learned throughout the years in the United States, whether we are uh, the first generation, second, or just like uh, Brother Tarek, who is the fourth generation, um, we have to improve our, uh, uh, our mindset. We have to be part of the decision making. We have to put our vote out there to change our life for the better. We have a great young uh, American uh, uh, Muslims uh, in colleges. The, some of them are just graduated. Some of them are looking into uh, future uh, political participation in the government. So it is important to have that voice being heard. The, uh, um, uh, the other thing which is very important is uh, our domestic issues and how we deal with it and uh, how, we to put, how we put it on the surface. Muslim community has a huge history uh, uh, in America in rebuilding and uh, uh, making, uh, being part of the defense uh, department, being part of the education, being part of the investment, being part of uh, medical uh, um, uh, and many other fields throughout the history. And uh, it is important, and it's about time that our voice become louder, our uh, decision become united, and uh, also our action show uh, part of it as Ameri proud American Muslim citizens in, in the United States uh, by participating in the ele in elections, as well as being uh, members who um, people will, will vote for, whether on a, a city council level or a Congress level or maybe in, in different positions. So um, with that, I would say, our future uh, as Muslim Americans in America, it has a great potential. If we focus on our goals and uh, if we, uh, un we unite our vote and uh, it's, uh, it's okay to vote uh, uh, Democrat or Republican or, or whatever we, we wish to do as we are in a free country. But it's important to put our goals uh, straight uh, and uh, to focus on development of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Zainab. Brother Jihad. Thank you uh, for this uh, opportunity to speak on this quickly closing panel. But I'll say this, I'm gonna focus on more of a grass tops level uh, where I believe there is an importance of organizing Muslim power 
collective developing issues, campaigns, and mobilizing people, what their interests recognize and what those positions are. And I think so there is a need, a greater need for Muslim American trained community organizers coming out of the tradition of the Industrial Areas Foundation, if people ever heard of the IAF or PICO or now called Faith in Action. Look these groups up. I mean, the famous book, Solonetsky, Rules for Radicals. It doesn't be radical, but it's about community organizing. And I think that's important. Muslim Americans, Islamic centers, social services organizations, and so forth at the local level, investing, particularly in our youth, but anyone can be trained on becoming a community organizer, understanding how to build power in coalitions and how to build power from the group grassroots up from the needs of communities, which turn them ultimately into campaigns on electoral votes and influencing elected officials. And in that process, people come eventually, can become if they want to run for office. But we need Muslim Americans, more Muslim Americans to be in the community organizing model. And if people are looking specifically for now emergent organizations that train Muslim Americans using some of these older models from the Industrial Areas Foundation or in Action, but in a Muslim paradigm, there's groups like the Muslim Power Build Project, Muslim Power Build, Power Build Project that's connected to a, a great group many people are hearing about, the Muslim ARC, Muslim Anti-Racist Co Collective. I think folks should look into these and we need to start investing as we've seen in Christian and Jewish communities, our communities having trained community organizers that help develop that understanding of political power, organizing and campaigning. Thanks, Brother Jihad. And that's uh, great tips and great uh, plugs of those wonderful organizations. And lastly, Brother Sahel. Thank you, Brother Tharik, and thank you everyone for listening to us. Just to tie this all together, again, you know, the topic of this conference is for in the spirit of Imam Ali and, of course, the spirit of reform. So what does that reform really mean? Uh, that reform really means for you to take action, and it is therefore your civic duty to take action on behalf of your community. And we have already talked about earlier on how just your vote can have an impact on swaying your local elections and and can really mean who would be your elected representative uh, representing you in Congress. So, and finally, I'd like to leave you with this and saying that, you know, this is just the beginning. Here we are in 2021 and our community is just getting started. The future looks bright and we look to you out there that's listening right now to do your part and to take part in our political process. Thank you. And thank you everyone for uh, following on with us at home. Thank you for everyone watching uh, this amazing conference. Again, thank you to Sayyid Jawad, the Ummah organization, Ahlul Bayt TV. And we wish you all a uh, congratulatory weekend and celebration of the birth of our beloved Imam. And uh, hopefully we can all stay safe and healthy during this time. And uh, we wish you all a, a very good rest of your Sunday evening or evening wherever you may be in the world. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.